Welcome in this uh, afternoon session. Uh, my talk will be over Linux disaster recovery as a service. So, welcome. My name is Christian Daas. I'm one of the uh, maintainers of the uh, Relax and Recover program. But this talk will begin with a broad uh, perspective talking about disaster recovery and disaster recovery planning, etc., etc. But let's start with it. Oh. Okay. The agenda. So the question sometimes is, do disasters really happen? Well, we'll soon know why. We'll talk about planning, about the software that is available on the market, how to do it in practice, how to exercise it. Then I will discuss in uh, particular the open source project to relax and recover. It's one of the open source projects that are related to disaster recovery. And as last topic, I want to spend some time describing what a disaster recovery as a service could mean, uh, how to build it up from ground. Okay, the question is, do disasters really happen? These are pictures from disasters that are only less than one year old. And fire can happen. Uh, this year we had a lot of snowfall, roofs collapsed. So this is a picture from, uh, from Belgium somewhere. You can have a an, an fluid water breakage, computer rooms can go underwater, etc., etc. Earthquakes is maybe less important in Belgium, but you never know, of course. But seriously, the most critical disaster that can happen is a burnout of your computer, a hard disk that fails. Uh, you could protect by a good fan. Well, it's a silly picture, but okay, it's uh, <laughs> to bring some joy in the talk. So to give you some. Small basics, if we talk about disaster recovery, and the disaster recovery is effect a small piece of a complete disaster. And, that, and disaster recovery is about how to restore a function, for example, a computer to a ready state again, so it is working as before. In contrary, you have also business continuity. That's the process. The process of the business, how will the business react when a disaster happens until that Business is restored as usual, as normally. So that's a complete different broad spectrum about disaster recovery, um, restoration in fact. In this talk, I will concentrate on the first part, disaster recovery of computer, data centers, etc. Albeit the second part would be a very interesting talk, but that will be for another time, I believe. So disaster recovery, the question is always, Will it happen? Yes, of course. Probably most of the people here in the room already had a disaster, more or less, a computer breaks. You lose your computer, for example. You lose important data. Uh, these things happen. Unfortunately, we are not always prepared. So the important lesson, if you go out here, is be prepared and react timely on a disaster. So before you can react timely, you need a plan. That's very important. So don't hesitate. If you have a disaster, you have to know what to do immediately. So I got often the question, I have a good backup server, a good backup policy. Excellent. You have to have that because it's very important to restore data. But in case of a disaster, backups are not always enough. Because you can restore your data, of course, but if you lose your computer, computer, you have to restore your computer. New hard disk, for example. You have to reload your OS. You have to fine tune it, reinstall your backup software. That takes a lot of time. And in case of disaster, you don't have that much of a time because you can lose so much time, days, sometimes weeks. I even had it a very long time ago that even after months, a lot of tweaks came up because they were from a disaster, because nobody knew how it was configured in uh, after months anymore. So it's very important to foresee these kind of things, and it can help you to, with a kind of inventory of your hardware and software. It's very important to have it. There's software available. I will speak about it a bit later. So the plan, disaster recovery plan. I will stress the word plan. That's very important. Before a disaster, you can act on the disaster, you need to plan everything. Uh, you have to find the money, uh, you have to convince your managers of a decent plan, you have to um, exercise a plan, so you need to have 
extra hardware available or you hire it. It, it depends on the, the amount of value you get from the, the managers. And it will guarantee that you, if you exercise it, that you know what to do, that you can act immediately. That's very important. And the last uh, line, that's very low, you can see it, is the less managers around you, in case of disaster, the better. Because they always tend to influence you to run in your way. It's very important. Decision makers, get them out. And with a decent plan, that's the way to do it. Very important. So what are the main steps in a disaster recovery plan? Well, the risk analysis. Before you can act on a plan, you have to know um, what can happen and what are the factors in my computer room which are important because not all the operating systems, not all the data, not all the um, computers, assets or functions of computers are equally important. So you have to make some categories which computers should be restored immediately. Like, for example, a database server is most of the times one of the important uh, things to restore immediately when a disaster happens or you exercise a disaster. It's very important. Um, you have to develop an, uh, a plan, of course. Um, you have to time it. You have to write it down. You have to make an uh, inventory. And therefore, you have to um, go around in your computer room. You have to know the labelings. The operators have to be trained and stuff like that. So there are a lot of checklists to be made and a lot of meetings to be done uh, with a lot of people. But the important point is uh, you have to convince your managers, your directors, your board of directors that you need a budget and a large budget, hopefully, to give you the time to exercise everything. Because it takes a lot of time to make a decent inventory and to test it, stuff like that. And very important is also the last line here. You have to test the disaster recovery plan. plan because once you made it, that's not enough. Because your computer room is continuously alive and changing. So there are new computers going out, other, others going out and uh, new things is coming, so you have to redo the exercise or the thinking about the planning, at least at a yearly basis. Also the testing, very important. To do it, not all the computers, but one in a time, for example, you could do to, uh, categorize it and just test it. Of course, uh, it's always better to prepare a disaster to avoid it effect. Uh, to, to, to keep it simple and stupid, some simple things is having good mirroring, Good backup, of course. Uh, test your restores of backups, very important. And uh, to make an inventory, this in the open source world, a very good uh, program available. It's, con it's called Configure 2 HTML. Um, that makes an, an kind of hardware inventory of your system, but also a software inventory, and keeps a listing of all your um, configurations effect. And you can put it aside. And of course, uh, when you are ready to start with, with that, you have to find a good, decent program to do the bare metal restores. There are quite a bunch available. I give you some overview of, of what is available now. Uh, the first choice is, do we go for commercial or open source? Yeah, I know. Uh, here we are all convinced that open source is the way to go. Me too. And luckily, uh, there are a lot of big companies, huge companies, that are realizing that uh, open source is not bad. Uh, I remember 20 years ago it was a disaster to convince the managers that open source was better than closed source. But the mindset is changing uh, in a good way that um, open source does get a chance also in the disaster recovery uh, environments. That's a good point. But anyway, whatever you choose, if it's commercial or open source, you have to test it. But because not every program does fit your needs, or you, maybe you don't like it anyway. So the testing is very important. Never test on a, com on a production server, of course. Always a test server. <coughs> so what are the solutions available in the open source world? Commercial, I don't talk about. You have uh, a lot of categories in the open source world. You have uh, disaster recovery models that are available in, for example, a backup solution. Um, to name one is Bacala, it's an open source uh, backup solution, it's a very good open source backup solution. But I'm not too fond of having a disaster recovery module that you get as an extra thing with a backup, because the main focus is on backup. And you can only be good at one point, backup or disaster recovery. 
So uh, you, you, you are very linked to Bakelite itself, and that's not always the best opportunity. But okay, it, if you like it, fine. Another possibility is the cloning. Cloning is nice to make new systems, but it's not the right way to do a disaster recovery because it's a snapshot, it's always old, and it's, it doesn't give you the flexibility that you need sometimes on new, a little bit different hardware. That's the problem with cloning system. It's not always 100% alike, and then it doesn't work. I had it all ready a few times, but it's okay. It's good for one purpose, but not for disaster recovery, in my opinion. But okay, you don't have to believe me, of course. Test it yourself. And then you have the true open source disaster recovery uh, software. Um, their main focus is on disaster recovery, luckily, and not on backup. But okay, you, you can do backups with it, but it's not really a backup solution. It's a disaster recovery solution that gives you also backups. But okay. And their main focus is to give you a very quick environment, user interface, not a very fancy user interface. That's not important. When you are in disaster recovery mode, you have only a laptop or a, a small terminal, sometimes only a prompt. So what the heck are you with a fancy user interface in that moment? You need command lines. You need to type something very fast, and it has to act immediately. Okay. In this category, we have three open source disaster recovery software available in the market. We have Mondo Rescue, that's about uh, from 2000. We have uh, MKCDREC, makes it drum recovery, and we have Relax and Recover. I can only say something about uh, MKCDREC because I, I wrote it also. So it's also my piece of software, which is the predecessor of Relax and Recover. It's a wonderful, wonderful program, but it's so monolithic. Uh, it's not flexible enough to, to react on chains, and you need chains also in disaster recovery models. Therefore, we rewrote, in fact, MKC Direct in a new program, Relax and Recovery. So, MKC Direct is still existing, and the user base is still very huge. Um, I try to convince people to go to Relax and Recover, but sometimes it's difficult because they like it so much. Okay. Uh, you have Mondo Rescue. That's uh, also a good program, but okay, I won't talk about it because I never use it much. So, okay, in disaster recovery, the medium or the data is very important. Never store your data of your disaster recovery on your local computer. Always use external data storage. Very important. Whatever the bootable medium is, is not that important. You have to boot your your new system via an ISO image, a CD, or whatever, or via the network, pixie booting, uh, via USB, via a tape with one button disaster recovery. Everything is possible. And you can mix the two things. Uh, you have a boot medium, and you have your data storage, where your backups are, restored, are stored on. It can be on the same media, it can be different. You can have a LAN-only solution that you boot from a uh, an central boot server, pixie server, and that in fact your uh, archivals or your data storage is in fact on a NAS server, on di different system, perfectly possible. Or in a different environment, where you don't have a, a fancy NAS server, you can have it on a tape, an external tape drive, you can boot from the tape, you can have it on a USB disk. These days the USB can be a total solution, you can boot from the USB and you have the data also on it, because in USB you can remove and store it in, in an fault somewhere, whatever. There are different solutions. Even TAR of R-Sync is possible. You can do it over the network. For example, a firewall. Uh, you don't have a lot of rules. You no only need uh, the secure cell R-Sync rule, in fact, to go through your internal data center. It's all possible. But it's, you have to configure it, of course. How does disaster recovery work in practice? First of all, you have to gather the system information. Uh, so the program that you use will collect all your data, network information, boot information, uh, your disk information, uh, all kinds of information has to be gathered. It has to be stored on a central place. Um, also the, the disk layout, uh, LVM, RAID stuff, uh, if you're using GRIP, LILO or ILILO for Itanium-based uh, systems. 
you have to make a system backup from that particular time, um, and also the user data, but not necessarily. And you have to make a bootable image, in fact, uh, because in the case of disaster recovery, you have to boot from that image that you created. That image can be stored on a CD, on a network, tape, USB, whatever. And all these steps are done online. That's the very nice thing of it. Uh, so you can have a production server, you can just launch it via CRAN or an, another queuing system, daily, weekly, whatever, and you have it online available. That is the practice for making the rescue image. Now, if you are in a disaster recovery mode, you need that rescue image to boot from. So you boot your system, and you have a toolbox. Okay, uh, and here I'm describing that for the rescue image, you need also the, the Linux kernels and the device drivers, uh, the network configuration, stuff like that. But okay. And it's all done in RAM, so the init RD environment. Now we come to the recovery phase. In the recovery phase, you need to boot from the rescue image. You have to restore your disks layout, first of all. You have to recreate your partitions, uh, the file systems that were originally created. You have to mount it, and then, once mounted, you have to restore the data from your data store, whatever it was. When that is done, you restore the bootloaders, and in fact, that's it. Once the bootloaders are there, you can do a manual inspection, inspection or not, depends, and you can just reboot your system, and that's finished. That's, in fact, the, the simple steps in disaster recovery, making an image and then uh, restoring the image back on the new hardware or a new virtual partition, doesn't matter, and just boot it, and it should work. Let's talk a little bit about Relax and Recover. Um, uh, Relax and Recover was uh, created in 2006, uh, together with my uh, colleague, uh, it's a German colleague, Shlomo Shapiro. Um, he was a very fan of uh, MKC Direct, and we decided together to rewrite it from scratch. He also has some open source projects, and together we, we rewrote it, in fact, in uh, two months' time or so. We have the first release available. So it was an incredible solution. And the way it was, because it was completely written in a modular way. But I'll come back to that later. <coughs> Relax and Recovery has come from a far away, from uh, 2006, where we have no users effect, until now that we have a very broad uh, user environment, um, going from big companies, uh, even in Belgium. Um, don't know if uh, Jeroen and Dag are available. Uh, no, he's not here, he's sick. Ah, he's sick, okay. Because, um, we can say that the federal police is going the open source way and they use um, relax and recovery for the disaster recovery feature. So, thank you, nice. federal police. But not only the federal police is using it, uh, the German government, uh, a lot of German governments are using it and also uh, quite a lot of commercial companies, even very big ones that are using it for the global disaster recovery policy. And important is, it's available since uh, beginning last year in Fedora, so you can just do yum install, rear. And also it is shipping with uh, SLES 11, SP2, SP3. Um, it is in the image over there. And it integrates, which is very important, we find that very important as a modular uh, system, you can integrate very easily external backup software. So there are already a few external backup software linked into rear so that your backup is in fact stored uh, with, uh, for example, uh, Tivoli or Data Protector or NetBackup. Bacala is also uh, available. So you don't care about rear with your backup. It's done by the really good backup software that you trust because the companies that trust their backup software because the, the, the operators are trained for it. So it's a very good selling point uh, that your disaster recovery system integrates very well with your existing backup software. But of course, uh, we are in an open source environment and we, first of all, we delivered GNU-TAR as the main uh, default uh, backup solution. Our sync is another possibility and now we have, uh, since the new release 1.9, Bacala also as an open source uh, solution. And it scales very well, that already told you that. Okay, a bit of history, I just mentioned already. It is, in fact, a spin-off of two open source projects. 
and it was released, and it was even in three weeks' time, not one month or two months. Okay, what are the features? Uh, relax the recovery or rear, which I will mention rear in the future, is focused on disaster recovery only. N backup is not, well, backup is important, but not the main focus. So we are not really interested in doing, in, let's say, uh, incremental backups. We try to do a complete full backup as the main uh, integration. So it's, in fact, a simple full backup integration. Um, it complements also the backup so of software, of course, because backup is very good in incrementals and gave you a long time uh, data storage, but backup software is not really intended to do disaster recovery. So the two software pieces, they fit together very well. And that, in fact, fact is what we try to propose, or what is our methodology, is say, use the best tool for the job. <coughs> so I already mentioned that, that um, external backup software or commercial backup software is uh, supported and included today. Um, even last week we had a new release 1.9. We are very excited with it because there are a lot of bug fixes uh, solved and also very, a lot of new features were added. But I will talk about that a bit later. So the integration is very transparent and other backup solutions are still available and still are missing. But for uh, commercial backup solutions, we are working with a sponsoring module. So we don't write it just for the fun. We can add it if you'd like to pay for this. And very important, in my opinion, that REAR is integrating very well in the network. So you can have a complete network-only solution. You don't have to fiddle with tapes or, or, or with CDs or with other external hardware. You can do it, but you don't have to do it. And that's the fundamental <coughs> important point if you want to make a an, an service around it. You have to make a service, you need a good network. Not everyone has a good network, but okay, for the, the big companies who can afford it, they do have it. A good network also means a good SAN solution, so that NAS or SAN is available, so you can have a very quick storage or retrieval from your storage from your environment. What is also important, um, that the companies, if we deliver the, the software, it's open source of course, that they can make their own branded RPMs or, or packages for them, it doesn't matter. So they can tweak it a little bit and they can repackage it and just distribute it to all their computers. I think that's an, uh, an advantage. And the scheduling, of course, that's done by their scheduling team or whatever. So the development of Rear is uh, an open source um, based model. And we're using SourceForce to store our data. And you can use Subversion to uh, get the snapshots available, but the snapshots are also available on the internet. Uh, you can have a daily update of our builds. Um, development is done based on sponsoring or also done by the community. We have some, um, well, I already told you we have two main developers, but there are quite some active developers in the community. Um, the two guys from the Federal Police, for example, they are very active the last months and working very close to us, with us, uh, to make new features available, which I am very grateful. And that's the, the strong point of open source, it is. You have a community, and the community you can feedback, uh, you get feedback from the community, and you get very good ideas. And together with it, you can have a discussion, and you can work uh, to a good solution, because sometimes we get patches, and we are very grateful that we get patches, but there's something very weak. And then uh, we have the community, and we can improve the patches very quickly, and that is uh, very nice. I, I like it very much, that framework. Why is that framework so important? Because REAR was built um, with, in the back of our heads, we knew uh, about the faults we made with uh, MKC Direct. It was very monolithic. It was a very strong program, and still very strong. It's so monolithic that only I were able, in fact, to do a very good code design, code development, code patching. That's not very good uh, module effect. The model that we now have is a framework. Uh, you can just plug in modules, 
And it's a very easy module because it's written in Bass. We don't have C coding, not yet so far. It's just a Bass script, very small, sometimes only 10 lines long that do a job. So it's easy to debug and you can just plug it in. I'll explain it a bit later. Documentation is online. I just released 1.9 of Rear and also the release notes. And the presentation will also be on our website, so you can then download it from the presentation section. I will do it uh, this evening. Um, didn't press. Okay. So the architecture of Rear. Um, I explained that it's a modular way. So if you do a, a command Rear dump you will get an, an overview, like uh, on the left side, not the pictures, of course, uh, that gives you what architecture are you running on, uh, what is the OS vendor, vendor uh, which version of the vendor you're using, um, and you have a configuration tree. The, on the left side, you see the, the configs which are available. Uh, most of the configs are a bit made by us and best practice. But there are two configuration files that are very interesting for you. It's called the site.conf and the local.conf. The site.conf effect is there you can put some variables for your site. For example, for your company, this is important. If you are working to the same Pixel server, you can define it, define it over there. For your local computer, you can just use the local.conf. And these are stored in the slash etc slash rear uh, directory. So how do you use it? All the scripts are stored under the user share rear subdirectories. There you find the complete directory structure. And uh, we have a list of methods. A method to make and rescue image, a method to restore it. So it's the same data. Your, your rear executables, well, scripts, are also on the rescue image. And also the configuration files. So each configuration file that you modify on the local computer is also on the rescue image. So it's copied the fact. So you have the exact same definitions and the exact same programs available. And you can make, uh, make backup or make backup only is available and the recover, important if you want to restore. And also you can plug in models, like I said, for example, the config to HTML is already available, not as a model, but if you install, for example, config to HTML, you can just enable it in rear with a variable, and then it will automatically detect it and run it and store the output of config to HTML in the subdirectories of var uh, slash var slash lib um, um, rear effect. Okay, already explained the, the site and the local configuration files. You can see some examples. Uh, an example output. Output could be an ISO, could be a tape, could be one better disaster recovery, for example. Uh, you have also backup definitions, NetFS. Uh, NetFS is, for example, uh, going using with an S server, NFS server, SIF server. Um, also, USB is a NetFS solution. And we tend to use a lot of the NetFS solution. And the NetFS goes together with the NetFS URL. And there are some other options. If you need, for example, user password credentials, you can have some options over there. These options, you don't have to know it by heart, of course. It's all described in the, in the concept guide. You can find it on the website. And we also have an, uh, a new file in the documentation directory or subdirectory that gives you an overview of the possible configurations that you can have to start with, because I know it's a bit confusing in the beginning, but that is fact it's very easy. Once you understand how it works, it's very simple. This is a simple output, output of the rear command. If you don't type any option, it will give you uh, some help and a list of commands which are available to type. Always handy to start with is the dump command, which you saw in a few slides before, that gives you an overview of which is your current OS. And then the second option that you can start with is make rescue, of course, that makes a rescue image without backup. If you say just make rescue, it makes a disaster recovery image, you can boot from it. So it's handy, you need to test it, you need to know if my image boots on my system or another system. So before you do a make backup and recover. Huh? But okay, 
don't worry, there are a few papers on already on the uh, internet that explain the commands and how to use it in different scenarios. The backup or rescue method, uh, uh, that's almost the same. Uh, there's only one difference, the make backup makes also a backup and the rescue is not. For the rest it's exactly the same. It has some phases. Uh, phases, already discussed a bit in the uh, disaster recovery analyzing. You have a preparation phase, you analyze your uh, system, and it's all stored under the varlib rear recovery subdirectory. So there you find your data on your local system. That directory is also copied on the rescue image. So you can always look at your local system to see what the lat latest status is of your um, configuration files. And know there's different phases. It's not that important that I explain it, but uh, you can find it in the constant guide a more detailed explanation of it. An example, if you use the flag minus S, it's a simulation. It's very interesting. It gives you an overview of all little subscripts which are included in a certain method or phase. Well, it's not readable, but okay, if you install it and just try it once, it doesn't harm anything. It does, doesn't do anything at all. It just shows you which commands or which commands methods affect and which scripts will be executed <laughs> in which order. The order is also very important. So from the left to the right. And you have a log file. The log file is stored on the slash DMP. It's called rear-hostname.log. Um, very interesting to look at. Um, not much output is given, but it's very good. If you have errors, you will see them there. Uh, the recovery phase is, well, it's the, the opposite. Huh? You have the recovery system. These are the, the steps that you re are required, is the verification. It will verify if your rescue image is capable of doing a recovery. Yeah? If you only did a make, re make rescue and don't have backup, and the method says, uh, for example, Bacala, but you didn't define any Bacala environment, yeah, of course, nothing can be restored, and it will complain about it. Okay? Very important to know is, if you decide a method to use, for example, a backup and an output, the recover phase will use exactly the same one. Uh, because I explained that the make rescue, make backup, and the recover are using the same set of configuration files. So don't expect to do something else. It's important to know. Of you have to foresee it. Not is, is impossible, but that's part of the planning. Also here you can do a minus S. You see that here it is a very small output because it was uh, a request restore. That is a very simple uh, method that will just do its job and then wait and tell you I'm ready for the restoration. And then you have to do a, an other ty kind of thing to restore your data. For example, an R sync or something else. And then it waits for you. And when you're done, you just click return and it does it, the rest of its job, the making bootloader active, for example. That's a very stupid uh, way of doing disaster recovery, but it is available. In some cases, it, it could be interesting. Already explained the config to HTML. <laughs> Cannot stress enough, it's quite important. If you activate it, you will see a line coming up, the red line over there, and you will have um, some extra lines or text files available under the uh, subdirectory var lib rear recovery config to html very handy in case of disaster what hardware did i had what operating systems were uh, operating systems, which configuration files are available how are the settings etc etc again the log file that's an example what is the status the status I already explained it is very mature on it on Intel and 46-based um, architecture. It's also working on Ethereum and PowerPC, but it's less tested. So it is working, but well, the more users will using it, more feedback we, we will get, of course. It is released as an RPM tar in depth, and it ships uh, with uh, Suzy, OpenSUSE and Fedora. And well, 
support is available via SourceForge, and we are open for patch submissions, of course. The more, the better. The current development, I uh, already mentioned, 1.9 has just been released, and it is the basic steps for uh, starting with cloning. It's still in beta. It does work, but you cannot rely 100% on it because we still need to tune um, things. So in the next release, it will be much better. But it is already usable for migration from physical to virtual, vice versa, whatever. And that worked quite well. The one button disaster recovery method is available. I don't think much people are using it still, but okay, it's there. And what my point is, the DHCP client is available, and you need that infrastructure um, for having a server service afterwards. So the network, again. And there's a toolkit available for doing other stuff than just recovery, but uh, to, to do some inspection of your system. What is still missing? is a central point of storage we already had. We had a central point of storage of your data via NAS server. What is still missing is a central point of your rescue images, for example, or your configuration files. Because it's, you do it locally, you, you put it on USB or on the tape or on CD, uh, and you, over your copy it manually to a, a central point. These kind of things could be automated. And that is, in fact, what we are working now as a future step. is called disaster recovery as a service collect also the rescue images configuration files to a central point so that we get a service around it and that uh, point software we will call real server so in the first phase in fact uh, we are collecting the information and making an, a web uh, based uh, interface around it so that you can just make a listing of uh, servers that you did in disaster recovery. Did it work? Uh, what were the failures? You can look at the log files, for example. You can restart it. These kind of actions should be possible in the first uh, phase. You can group it by department, by host, OS, stuff like that. That will be the, the planning for the coming months. And the plans are uh, now after six months uh, predicting in, uh, getting very real. So you may expect that within the six months, the first release of Free Server will be <coughs> released. Um, what are the requirements? Uh, it should go, for example, through a firewall, um, other boundaries, uh, network boundaries. Um, it should be protocol independent, so we don't want to have fancy protocols used. Uh, we only want to use the standard available protocols on the systems, so we don't want to install too much other stuff except the rear server, perhaps. But even the rear server on the side of the client shouldn't be any additional software. It should be just a new rear version, in fact. The rear server is only on the central part. Maybe a few changes are required in the rear software, new variables. Um, you have to point to a rear server. Um, the sent results, uh, how do you want the the data to be sent via mail or via HTTP, for example, and some other small things, and maybe a, a, a bit of bunch of scripts to plug in in the right spot. The real server architecture could be like this. It's not 100% uh, defined. We are still open for discussion, and discussions are ongoing on the mailing list, on the developer's mailing list of rear. So if you like it, just subscribe yourself to the rear uh, mailing list of development and you can have a live discussion with us. How do you want to see it? What is the best approach? Because we have our own ideas and we already know from the past our ideas are maybe not always the best ideas. So the more interaction there is with the community, the better and that we can choose the, the best way to go forward. So a central point could be a NAS server. We could use MySQL or something else. It's not 100% defined, but okay, Apache or PSP is probably uh, very usable and will be used. We could have Postfix as a uh, delivery point, but we had now at the moment uh, discussions to use WebDev, for example, and using the HTTP or maybe even the, the, uh, the SSL link for enhanced security. Very plausible discussions and we are uh, really having good conversations around it. So we are starting with it, and that is uh, very uh, good and very challenging for everybody. So the design considerations. Okay, I mentioned a few of them, but uh, don't take it for granted that these will be the final 
once. We are still open for discussion. Um, I won't talk too much about it. But okay, the thing is we'll use standard components, like for example Postfix, like Apache, PHP, MySQL, or another database. And uh, we don't want to use a daemon. So it should be something that you push, the client push. Of course, there have to be another way. Uh, if you want to do a restore, how do you do, you do it? Do you do it via secure shell command execution or something else? S that's still not 100% defined, but okay. Uh, okay, the web GUI interface could uh, be, uh, authentication could be done by LDAP, um, so Apache can handle that for us, Kerberos, stuff like that. Uh, this is only PHP scripts behind a, an Apache uh, server, so that's not so difficult to, to create. But it's interesting to have, to have a central point that you, all your systems are available and listed. Okay, um, the real server, um, standard software. Okay, the roadmap, and almost this is the last slide. Uh, this is the roadmap, the 1.5, uh, the 1.0. Uh, hopefully, will be released uh, mid this year. So that uh, it is a, as a complement for rear the, the rear server that we can have an, an creating a service around disaster recovery, which is very good and very nice and that have an, an extra functionality around disaster recovery. And there, of course, there are next steps, but uh, let's go to the first step first. If you want to contact us, this is the website. We are the maintainers. Uh, do not hesitate to uh, subscribe yourself to the mailing list. And um, that was it for the, my talk. Uh, I'm open for questions. Please shoot. Yes. You showed there one of the um, directories where all the scripts are in. So those are all shell scripts. Bosch? Yep. Shell. And the question was, can you show us um, <laughs> a directory where all the scripts are available or stored in? Uh, on this PC, I cannot show it because it's my disaster recovery PC. My PC where everything was on did not respond on the... Uh, yeah, is it written in Bosch? It's all written in Bosch, yes. It's all written in cell scripts, pure simple cell scripts, and you can find everything under the slash USR share rear subdirectory. And then you have a structure depending on the method you choose. Uh, but it is explained quite well in the concept guide, how the structure is uh, aligned and how does it work. And of course, use the minus apps s uh, simulation to to show which directories are in fact executed and which scripts in the directories. Yes, please. Is this Linux only at the moment? Yes. The question is: Is this Linux only on this moment? Yes, it is. Um, we are open for others um, because this morning I took an uh, a CD from FreeBSD just to uh, to try it out. But okay, uh, for the moment it's only Linux. Um, we have Ubuntu, we have uh, Red Cat, we have Fedora, we have all the others. Please. Yes, the question was partition layout. Is this also copied? Yes, of course. That's the basic of disaster recovery. Uh, everything that is important to have in, uh, a restoration of your system is copied. The question is, if you want to do a uh, restoration of your partitioning on another hardware, yes. uh, if you have to do it uh, manually or not, well, that is the purpose of the new release, that with the cloning P2V, that the flexibility is uh, built in the uh, scripting, that it will recognize uh, other layouts. And if needed, it will propose you a question. Yes, please. Yeah. The question was, um, I did not like cloning software. Well, I, I didn't like it for disaster recovery purpose, uh, I meant. How do we solve it with rear? Well, the thing is, rear is made for disaster recovery. So we had already in the back of our minds that not all hardware that we restore in are equal. So therefore we're using, uh, for example, UDEF to recognize different hardware systems, n other types of hardware. And it will propose you a method to change, for example, a SCSI disk with a SAS disk or another type of disk. 
it will propose you that. That is a major step forward in the 1.9, that the cloning functionalities is more flexible. In the previous releases, it was much more strict. And then you had to do some manual tweaks. But we try to avoid it because, like we said, uh, in a disaster environment, it has to be automatically, as much as possible. And these kind of things we can, in fact, uh, trigger and in interact with it to, uh, to propose you a decent uh, new style of underlying hardware for the network, for the storage. Yes. yes um, yeah. <laughs> what about virtual machines and uh, virtual servers? So you have the base uh, system, which you have to restore first, and then to restore the various virtual disks. Yeah. Anything integrating that here? Uh, the question was, what about virtual systems uh, within a basic um, ESX si system, for example? Yeah. yeah. Um, for the for the moment, if you are talking about the main system that carries the virtual systems, it will restore the main system and the backups if you want it. But it will not restore the virtual systems if they are running, uh, because uh, there's another kind of status. So if you want to virtual systems, you also backup or do a disaster recovery of the virtual systems. In the companies that I work, uh, we do it like that also. And so you basically make a bootable ISO, which then you boot within the virtual machine as the uh, yeah. boot part of the virtual machine. Yeah, the, the, the question was uh, that we restore the virtual machines as with an ISO image. We restore the virtual systems, in fact, like we restore physical f systems. There's no difference in the method of booting, method of restoring. Another question? Yes? Yeah, I, I believe the question was, what about LVM in uh, Debian? Yeah. Okay, um, Debian is on our list of um, supported hardware and software. So normally we have a bunch of uh, test systems because I know disaster recovery is a pain to test always, so we cannot test everything. But normally, by my knowledge, Debian is working quite well. And, well, for the moment. Uh, we don't have tested everything, of course, but uh, as far as we know, that uh, it is working quite well with Les, uh, with, uh, with, Les, uh, with uh, Fedoras, Red Hats, uh, Ubuntu, and Debians. Uh, they are on most tested uh, environments. And there are others uh, on the list. Other questions? Oh, this far. What kind of SAN components do you support? SAN. The question was, what kind of SAN components do we support? Uh, any can, kind of SAN that is your Linux is supporting. If the Linux is supporting uh, the drivers, if you use them, they will automatically be copied to the rescue image, and they will be activated automatically. So we're using, for example, in uh, some companies, um, the XP storage or EMC storage. That's quite transparent. Oh, another question. Do you, do you, does RIA need distribution-specific configuration files? Do you need, with every new distribution version, do you need to update a set of information gathering files? Or do you, do you simply have the strategy to copy everything? Or do you need to update some configuration file for every release and how much work? No. The question is, for every new release, do we have to update the local configuration files of your, or your site configuration files? Um, no, not, if, not really. It's always backwards compatible. So if you do an upgrade with RPM, the local configuration file is always saved. No, but I mean, oh. I mean um, does Korea need to have knowledge about the Fedora operating system? Do you have special yes. configuration yeah. systems? Yep. Okay. To a new version of the release of the operating system, do, yep. you, do you need to prepare a special release specific version of your file? Okay. The question was with a new release, for example, if uh, Fedora, does Rear also needs new versions of it? Well, to understand the new version, yes, that's true. Uh, for example, to give a very simple, uh, this is the last question, by the way, a simple uh, explanation on it. Um, 
We have Upstart to boot your systems. We have the Sys5 init environment. And with the new uh, Fedora, which is still not available, the 15, we will be using systemd. Systemd is not yet supported. It's on my list for the coming weeks. But for the 1.9 release, I decided to, to not support it yet because I did not have the time to, uh, to roll it out and to test everything again. So it was decided to make an, a newer version within a couple of weeks that supports the new boot environments. And we do it, in fact, for every new stuff available. Uh, a lot of patches are coming from that. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your feedback. And hopefully enjoy Relax and Recover. Thank you. <laughs>